Good morning. It's great to see all of you here with us as we start this new series. About a year ago in August, uh, my wife and I went on a trip for our 20-year wedding anniversary. And it was a trip we were really excited to go on. We've been planning for a while. And what we did is we went to California to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to hike all around and we wanted to see these incredible huge trees, these sequoia trees um, out in this area. And so uh, we, we got all our plans together. We went and what they make you do before, they let, before you go hiking and, and looking at these trees, what they recommend you do is that you go to the, what's called the Giant Forest Museum so you can pick up a field guide. And a field guide is basically this little brochure that you pick up there before you start your hike that, that tells you all these things so that you can know that you can spot a sequoia when you see one. And so as we pulled up there, I took this picture actually uh, as we were walking to the museum. Uh, right there, that little building right there is the Giant Forest Museum. That is the building that you go into to pick up the field guide so you can know how to spot a sequoia when you see one. <laughs> Seemed a little unnecessary to me at the time. But, but still, you know, this is what they say to do. So we picked up one of those field guides and we started out on our hike. And as we were hiking along, actually, this field guide that we had been given actually came in really handy. We actually used it a lot. Uh, in fact, right away, I picked up what I thought was a sequoia pine cone. It was this huge pine cone. I took this picture of it because I was so enamored with it. Like, wow, this must be a sequoia pine cone because it was just so enormous. And then I looked in the field guide and I found out, actually, no, that's not a sequoia pine cone at all. Um, what I'm holding right here in my hand is actually a sequoia pine cone. I brought it back from the trip. And if those of you in the back row right now are going, what is that? I can't even see what he's holding up in his hand. It's so small. That's the idea. Yes, it is the smallest pine cone in the entire forest. And this is a full-size one. They're this small. And it's from these tiny little pine cones that these giant sequoia trees grow. Um, and in case you're worried about me going home and trying to plant this in my backyard and grow a sequoia in my yard, we learned a few other things from this field guide we were given as well. What we learned is that actually you can't just grow one anywhere. The only place that these giant trees grow is in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Not only that, from the field guide, I learned that uh, they, not only do they only grow in the, the Sierra Nevada mountains, they only grow on the western side, on the western slope. And not only do they only grow on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada, they only grow between 5,000 and 7,500 feet of elevation. You go below 5,000 feet of elevation, no sequoias. You go above 7,500 feet, no sequoias. It's, it's right in this area where the air is perfect. The conditions actually have to be perfect for these trees to grow and for them to exist. Not only that, but these pine cones don't actually open and let the seeds out unless there's a forest fire. So these trees that are some of them 1,000, 2,000 years old have been through multiple forest fires, and it's only these forest fires that produce the heat that actually opens these cones, and, and unless there's a forest fire, they never actually reproduce. All these things, all these conditions have to absolutely be perfect for these trees to grow and to exist. And, and so with this series we're starting today, uh, Field Guide for a Follower, what we're doing over the next few weeks is we're asking the question, if you were to have a field guide for how to spot a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, how would you spot one? <laughs> what would be the things in that field guide? What would be those markers, those things that would tell you, oh, this is a fully devoted follower of Jesus? What, what marks, what distinguishments, if you were out in the world, how would you spot a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ? That's the idea behind this field guide for a follower how do we spot that? How do we know what sets a follower of Christ apart from everybody else? And so what we're doing is we're going to be journeying for the next few weeks with the Thessalonian church. And uh, Paul wrote in your New Testament, maybe you've noticed there's two letters to the Thessalonian church called 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And Paul wrote this letter uh, to encourage the, this church that was there in Thessalonica. And tell the story of the, little, of the church a little bit. In Acts 17, what we find is that Paul had come to Thessalonica in the ancient world in the first century, and he'd begun to preach the name of Jesus. And a church got started there in Thessalonica. And what happened was as Paul began to preach the name of Jesus, he began to be accused of political treason. In this town, in this city, he was accused of preaching another king besides Caesar, which was a no-no in the first century world. 
And it was because he was preaching the name of Jesus. And so what happened is his life came under threat. And so Paul had to very quickly, like without any warning, he had to pack up his bags and he had to leave. He had to get out so, his, so he wouldn't be killed, essentially. And when Paul exited like that, it cast kind of a shadow on the church of Jesus there in Thessalonica. And what happened is the remaining church, the followers of Jesus there, began to be squeezed by the culture around them. And so what Paul does is he writes this, what we believe is actually his first Pauline letters. The first letters that Paul wrote to a church were, was First and Second Thessalonians. And we believe that he wrote this first letter to the church to talk about how do you spot a true follower of Jesus in the midst of a culture that is squeezing the church. Now, that's nice, Brian. What does that have to do with us today, right? I believe that we are in a time in our history as the church and here in the West where I believe the church is being squeezed right now. Not in the same way maybe that the Thessalonican church was being squeezed, maybe it's different issues, but I don't know if you've noticed, but Christianity in our culture is being moved more and more and more to the margins of our society. Uh, as author David Wells said, God is not absent, he is weightless in terms of the significance and, and the importance of how seriously people take the Bible, how seriously people take the name of, of God, that moral authority of the scriptures, is, God is becoming more and more weightless. And so what's happening is tolerance has become the highest moral value of our society. And the only thing we won't tolerate is intolerance, which of course doesn't make any sort of logical sense, but that is the, the highest moral value of our, of our uh, culture of our society is tolerance, and anything that is intolerant is viewed as being almost immoral. The only thing we won't tolerate is intolerance, and so if you take any sort of moral stand on any sort of issue in any way, shape, or form, you're accused of being intolerant. And, and that's the culture, that's the society we're living in, and I don't know, I found myself wondering, I found myself asking the question, and I wonder if some of you have also asked this question as you've kind of watched things unfolding in our society. And the question is, why does the Western church look so much like the world? Why more and more do, does the church, do the people of God look just like everybody else in our culture? Why is it that it's so hard to distinguish anymore? Who, who's a follower of Jesus and who isn't? It's, it's hard to notice any kind of distinguishing characteristics. That's something that's happening in our world right now as the church is being squeezed. The church is looking more and more like a culture. But there's another thing that's happening at the same time, just to encourage you, and this is good news. At the same time, in this moment that we're seeing the church looking more and more like the rest of the world, there is a rise of another group of people. And this is a rise of a group of people who are not so interested in pop theology, not interested in a Christianity that's devoid of any sort of real depth or truth or meaning. But there, it's, it's a group of people who are hungry for the true Jesus. They're hungry for what it means to truly lay their lives down and follow Jesus. And that group of people is on the rise as well. And so what we're doing with this, uh, this series is we're looking at what I would argue is the perfect conditions. I think right now we are experiencing the perfect conditions in our society to produce true followers of Jesus. Not just some pine trees, but true sequoias of the faith. Men and women of God who are going to be raised up in this generation to be an example of the gospel, uh, an example and a witness to the truth, even in our society as the church becomes more and more and more squeezed. And so what I want to do is I just want to begin, uh, we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to begin with Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica as it's being squeezed. And the first thing Paul tells us, as we're looking at today, is that one way you can spot a true follower of Jesus is in the way that they hold on to the gospel, the way they hold on to the gospel message, even in the midst of when the church is being squeezed. Let's take a look at this together. Um, 1 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 2, Paul says, We always thank God for all of you, talking to the church there, the, the Christ followers in Thessalonica, and we pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the gospel, the good news, 
It was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering that it brought you. Now, time out. Hold on just for a second there. They received the message of the gospel with great joy, this internal joy it produced in their lives when they, when they received the gospel message and they were uh, reconciled to God through Jesus. But then it, in spite of the fact that it produced severe suffering, we don't, that's not what, what's supposed to happen, right? The gospel actually produces severe suffering in our lives when we receive it. See, that's not how we think about the gospel, is it? We think that the gospel is supposed to be like the antidote to suffering, right? It's supposed to be the thing that takes away suffering and and helps us to fit in better with others and have a, a better life. But in actuality, oftentimes, when we really embrace the gospel in our lives, what happens is it sets us apart and it creates a distinction between people who are truly trusting in the person of Jesus and people who are just putting their faith and their trust in their own idols, their own devices to solve their problems in their life. It actually creates a distinction and makes people stand out. In spite of the fact they had this joy for being reconciled to Jesus, there was this severe suffering that it brought them as well. He goes on, in this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For everywhere we go, for wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. What I think is so powerful about this passage is that when the gospel really began to take hold in their lives, the gospel didn't help the church in Thessalonica fit in better in Thessalonica and Thessalonica. What the gospel did is it made them stand out and be an example to believers and to people well beyond Thessalonica, well beyond Macedonia and Achaia. God God used them to be an example to stand out and be different well beyond just their post where they were stopped, where they were at. He goes on from there. We don't need to tell other people about it for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Jesus, the gospel is a rescue operation. That's what it is. So the question I just want to ask and I want to entertain uh, just for the next few minutes is, how in the world did this church, this church uh, in Thessalonica, how did they stay strong in their faith in the midst of persecution? Does anybody else want to know that? How, when you're in a season and a time where, where the church is being squeezed, how in the world do you stay strong in your faith, even in the midst of when things are falling apart at the seams and when no one seems to get it? How did they do that? How did they stand strong in their faith? I think Paul mentions two things that they did. I just want to look at here together. I'll, say, I'll, talk, I'll give you both of them, and then we'll talk about them. The first thing in verse 9 he says is uh, he's, he says they turned from idols to serve God. And the second thing they did is they focused on the promised future hope of the gospel in verse 10. First one there, turning from idols to serve God. What you have to understand when Paul says, for you've held on to the gospel, you've turned from idols to serve the only true God. What we don't kind of realize in our context is that turning from idols didn't just make you kind of weird in a city like Thessalonica in the ancient world. It actually was offensive. It actually, there was actually quite a cost to it. We don't realize that actually what would happen is in these ancient cities, there would be like a patron god or goddess And there would be a temple for that deity, whatever that patron god or goddess of that city was. And so if you wanted to do business, if you wanted to set up a trade and do business in that city, you would have to go to that temple. You would have to worship that idol. You would have to to bow down to that deity. And that was sort of like the entrance fee to be able to participate and be a part of the community. And so if you were turning from idols to serve the true and living God, you could lose your job. You could lose your, your, your way of making money. You could very realistically be cut off from your neighborhood, from your community, and isolated. 
Uh, you could be accused of political treason, which is basically what happened to Paul and why he had to leave the city so quickly. I mean, there was a cost to this. They turn away from the idols of their, of their culture, their culture is putting their faith in, and they begin to just put their faith and their trust in the person of Jesus, and that would have gotten them noticed. Now, we don't have, like, temptations today to, like, worship some deity in a temple necessarily right here uh, in order to participate and do business. You know, thank God we don't live in a country where that's the kind of thing that we're expected to do. But, but there are other idols. There are other idols that are... are our world tells us we should worship these things, we should be about these things, and if you don't, somehow you're being left behind. And the, the church, when it's being squeezed, the temptation is to turn away from the gospel message, to turn away from the person of Jesus and to begin to put our trust and our faith in idols. The other thing that uh, they did is they focused on the promised future hope of the gospel. One of the things that's so interesting to me about the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians is at the end of every single chapter of 1 Thessalonians, what you'll notice is that Paul makes a reference to the second coming of Jesus. At the end of every single chapter, he points toward, hey, don't, don't forget, don't uh, take your eyes off the prize, don't forget Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to rescue us from the terrors of the coming judgment is what he said and what we just read there in verse 10. But at the end of every chapter, he's saying, don't, don't forget Jesus is coming back. He's trying to remind them that with the kingdom of God that Jesus came to initiate, there is an already, there's a sense of, man, already right now we have joy in the Holy Spirit. We have joy in being reconnected to God and knowing him. But there's also a not yet to the kingdom of God. There's, a, there's an unseen reality that's not yet, that, that's gonna be eternity it's going to be forever as Jesus comes and he reconciles the world. And so he's talking about that. He keeps pointing them to this future hope. And what I want you to see with this is that the gospel message is not that Jesus came to die on a cross and rise from the dead so that your, our lives could become happier and easier and so that we could fit in a little bit better. The gospel message is that it will be worth it in the end to put our faith and our trust in the person of Jesus. There, because there is no idol in our world that can possibly bring satisfaction, that can possibly bring happiness and fulfillment and eternal joy. Jesus is the only source of eternal joy that this world has to offer. And so that's what, what he's calling them to hold on to. That's what he's calling them to focus on and to think about. Now, uh, you need to know something, and I said this to first service as well. From this point of the message on, um, I, uh, I thought I was going to be saying something very different. I, I do message prep and plan things out, and last night I came in uh, into this room, and I began to just pray and just kind of go over my message notes, and I had my message of what I thought I was going to say, and um, God just began to speak to me, quite honestly, as I was praying last night, and I... I feel like God just said, what you had planned, Brian, is not what I really want to say. And so um, I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you what I think God uh, wants me to say. And just so you know, if you're new here, this doesn't happen all the time. This isn't like a, a regular thing. Um, but I felt like last night, God just arrested me and stopped me and just said, Brian, I want to speak to some people in the room. And what you had planned to say is not what I want to say. And I want to say something. And so I'm just going to go for that, and uh, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't, we'll see, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be obedient to that. So what I want to do with the rest of the message, I want to talk to some of you in the room. I think there may be some of you here in this room, in your life, you are feeling squeezed right now, and maybe there are temptations that are facing you that it would just be so much easier just to give in and just to go along with what everybody else is doing, what other society is doing. And you're wondering, is it really worth it to stand my ground and to turn away from that idol or turn away from that thing and really, like, is Jesus really the one who's going to rescue me? Is he really the one who's going to be there for me? And you're feeling squeezed. You're wondering if your faith is worth it. I wonder if there are some of you in this room today, you're feeling squeezed even with your own family, 
Like as you've begun to follow Jesus, as, as you begin to put your trust in him, you're actually, as you begin to live differently and talk differently, what's happening is your own family members have started to really squeeze you and start, starting to put pressure on you. And they don't understand what they're seeing. They don't understand what you're doing. And so the very people that you thought were going to understand and were going to be there for your family, they actually don't get it. And you're being squeezed. I, I, I believe there might be some of you in this place today, maybe in your business in your company, in your employment, in your job, there are areas where you are being squeezed and it would just be so much easier to just do what the world does, to do business the way the rest of the world does it and, just to, and not to actually live out the truth of the gospel. And maybe you're actually facing a situation where it would cost, it's gonna cost you money. You're gonna lose out on a deal. You're not gonna be, go as far in your career as as somebody else might go because you're not willing to do certain things. And your question, you're wondering like, is it really worth it to hold on to the gospel? I think God wants to say a couple words of encouragement to you. If that's you, if you're being squeezed this morning, I want to just offer a couple words of encouragement that I think that God wants you to hear today. Okay? So the first thing I want you to hear, the first encouragement for when we find ourselves squeezed I want you, maybe this is just a reminder, I want to just remind you that the greatest need of every single person is Jesus. The greatest need of every single human being is not money, purpose, power, sex, relationships. It is Jesus. He is the deepest need of any human being. And we forget that. When I was 16 years old, I witnessed a terrible car crash. Uh, my friend and I, uh, we were driving in her car on a country road in Indiana. And so it's out in the middle of the country, you know, where the houses are far apart on these small lanes. And we were coming up, uh, up to a hill, as much as a hill is in Indiana. And as, as we began to come up over this hill, this car comes over the top of the hill. And it's this woman driving this older car. And she is across the yellow line. And she is headed straight at us at a pretty good rate of speed. And my friend, when she sees this car, she slams on her brakes and comes to a screeching halt. And this lady slams on her brakes and she be- the tires lock up and she begins to swerve. And her car swerved like this and came literally right in front of our bumper. And the car smashed right into the telephone pole that was right here on our side of the road. And because this was an older car, it had like one of those bench seats in the front. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you remember those. And because she was not wearing her seatbelt... When her car came across this way and smashed right into the telephone pole right in front of us, there's this image burned into my head. I will never be able to forget it as long as I live. As soon as she hit the telephone pole, she flew across that bench seat and her head went right through the passenger side window. And it's like burned into my memory. I could see her even right now just coming through that window and she was kind of half out of the window, half in the car. And my friend who was driving the car, I remember she just like closes her eyes with her hands on the steering wheel and she just goes, I can't look, I can't look, I can't look. That's all I remember her doing. And I think I sat there, I don't know how long, for like a minute or so, just sort of shocked and stunned at what I was seeing. And finally, I I unbuckled my seatbelt, I got out of the car and I walked over to this lady. I walked over to the car and I just remember like blood is just pouring off of her head. It was like matting her hair. I just remember like her hair had all this blood and it was just matting her hair. But she was, she was conscious, like she was making noises, but she was obviously seriously injured. And so here's the thing. Um, I didn't want to offend her by suggesting that she needed help. I didn't want to, like, get involved. I mean, this was a messy situation, you know, with all the blood and everything. I didn't want to, like, offend her or, su- or in any way kind of suggest that she needed help or that uh, her situation was, a, was not a good situation. And so ultimately what I ended up doing is I ended up turning around, walking back to the car, and my friend and I drove away, and we left her there on the side of that road by herself. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> Seriously? What kind of a terrible story would that be if that's what I actually did? (laughs) Why would I even tell you that if that's what I actually did? Why would I admit to it? Of course, that's not what I did. What I did was uh, there was a house up the road a little ways out in the country in Indiana. So I remember running up to this house, pounding on this door, and this lady answered the door of this house. 
and I said, there's been an accident up the road, can you call 911? This is before the days where everybody was carrying a cell phone. And she said, yeah, of course. And then I asked if she had some towels. I remember getting a couple towels, and I went back, and my friend who had gotten out of the car finally at this point, we sat with her and, and put the towels on her head and tried to just sort of, you know, uh, put pressure there until the rescue vehicles came, and they came there, and thank God they took over, and they rescued her, and she was okay. Now, I don't think any of you are probably tempted in any way, shape, or form to just, like, run away physically from the scene of an accident right now. But here's the question. Are there any tough conversations that you are running away from right now? Are there any places where, man, it's just going to be so messy and this is going to be such an awkward conversation. I just, I'd rather just get back in my car and just keep going down the road and put the sight of that wreckage for that person and their life in my rearview mirror. Are there any places in your life where you're just avoiding a tough conversation. Sometimes the, the people that are the angriest, the, the meanest, the most horrible and the things they say to us and the, and the way they behave and the, the kinds of stuff they say about God and the church because they're so angry, sometimes those are the people who are hurt the worst. Sometimes those are the people that are so desperate and wrecked and the, the reason they're acting what, the way they're acting is because they're injured, because they're in need of a rescue. And the greatest need of every single human's life is Jesus. He is the greatest need of any of our lives. Don't forget that. Don't shy away. As followers of Jesus, what we do is we, we lean in to tough conversations. We don't water down the gospel. We don't avoid it. We don't get back in the car and drive away. We lean in. We're part of the rescue operation. Second thing I want to say to some of you in this room who are just feeling squeezed right now is this idea that the greater the struggle, the greater the joy. I just want to remind you of this, that the greater the struggle that we experience in our lives, the greater the joy on the other side. Again, in, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, at the end of every single chapter, Paul says, don't forget this persecution, this suffering that you're going through right now, it is temporary. And he keeps pointing them forward and he keeps saying there is this eternal reality, there is this eternal joy. And the greater the thing that you're suffering right now, the greater the joy that's going to be when Christ comes because he is the ultimate reality. There's an already of knowing Jesus and there's a not yet. Don't take your eyes off of the not yet. There was a family who was a part of Frontline, um, friends of ours. And uh, at one time they were a part of things. They had uh, kids that were our kids' age. And they had a two-year-old daughter. And one night uh, she, their two-year-old daughter suffered a horrible, massive brain aneurysm. And it left her severely disabled. And she lived a few more years after that, and then she passed away. And I remember sitting with her dad, my friend. And he would talk about that night when, when the aneurysm happened, and he would talk about uh, the events of what took place. And he said, you know, in the middle of the night, they're sound asleep, he and his wife, and all of a sudden, his daughter wakes up, and she's just screaming. I mean, just screaming at the top of her lungs in her crib. And he doesn't know she's in pain. He has no idea. So he gets up and he goes in there and he picks his daughter up out of the crib and he's tired and he's short-tempered and he's frustrated and he's kind of being gruff with her. And he, he just has no idea, you know, what's happening to her until the seizures started and then suddenly he realized what was going on. And so he would, we would sit and talk, he would talk about the last five minutes that he had with his daughter. He would talk about like those last five minutes late at night when he picked her up out of the crib. These were the last lucid moments I had with my daughter before she was forever changed by this um, aneurysm. And he would talk about those last five minutes as if they were like a ghost that, that followed him around. The, re the regret, the shame. Like really, in her last five minutes with her father, that's the way I acted? 
that's the way I treated her. I was angry. I was frustrated. I, that's real, that was the last five minutes that she had with her earthly father were, were about suffering and they were about pain. I said, but you but don't forget in Jesus, there's also going to be a first five minutes that she's going to have with her heavenly father. And I would say, can you imagine what the first five minutes is going to be in heaven with her heavenly father when she is restored and she is healed and she is returned. I said, in in Christ, if you put your faith and you put your trust in in Jesus, can you imagine what your first five minutes are going to be like when you are reunited? I said, you're going to know a joy the rest of us, we don't get to have. And I wish for my friend, I still to this day wish for my friend, I wish that he could spend more time focusing on those first five minutes and I wish that he would just let the last five minutes just go. That's what Paul is trying to say to the Thessalonians. That's what he's trying to communicate to them. He's trying to say, whatever it is, whatever the last five minutes have been for you, whatever it is that you're facing right now, whatever struggle you're encountering, whatever persecution, however you're being squeezed right now, it is temporary. Because of the cross, because of the resurrection, Jesus is the ultimate reality. He is eternal, and his kingdom will last forever. And as people, as God's church, that's what we're supposed to be fixed on. In another place, in Romans 8, 18, Paul says, I don't even consider our present sufferings even worth comparing to the joy that will be revealed in us. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, where, O death, is your sting? This idea that all of us are going to face death. Every single one of us in this room at some point are going to face death. But because of what Jesus did and because the tomb is empty, death has no sting. The sting has been actually taken out of death. It has no power anymore over us. That's the hope we have. That's the future that we have. Do you need to be reminded today in the midst of a time where you are being squeezed that the greater the struggle, the greater the joy on the other side. God did not send Jesus to die on a cross to help you fit in better. He sent Jesus to die on a cross to help you stand out and be an example and be raised up, not just some pine tree, but a a true sequoia of the faith. To, To be raised up, to be fully rooted in Christ, to be fully surrendered to him, And to have a joy that doesn't come from your external circumstances, it doesn't come from this life. It's it's so bigger, so much greater, so much beyond this life that nothing literally can stop you. That's what he wants to do. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Next week, we're going to talk about what it means to live this kind of faith out. How do you spot a, a true follower of Jesus in work? We're places of work and places of school and places where we uh, spend our time. Um, So Jesus, we just come before you right now in this place and we just recognize, God, that what we're experiencing, whatever ways in this room even, there are brothers and sisters who are just being squeezed. Uh, God, today we choose to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. So God, would you awaken us? Would you allow us to be people who hold to the gospel, who hold to the truth, who turn from idols and who pursue Jesus with our whole hearts, who focus on the promised future hope that we have? And God, would would that just be the the base note of our lives? Would it be the thing that drives everything, the, the thing that just keeps keeps us going every single day. We thank you, God, for the cross, for the resurrection. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. And we just say again today, we believe it wholeheartedly. It's in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.